We arrived at the anomaly one week ago and settled into our respective stations. I arrived with three others and we were all assigned tasks specific to our abilities. I was meant to monitor communications, whereas the others were charged with arrivals, Victor, life support, Cassandra, and power systems, Lucy. The venture was meant to last two weeks before we were to be replaced by the third expedition. The task of the first had been to simply prepare the site for our arrival. Fortunately, they did so without error and we were able to arrive as scheduled. We had completed our cursory setup within the anomaly by the end of our first day on the site. The anomaly was pushed into the seafloor roughly 34,000 feet below the surface of the Pacific Ocean. Based on our initial readings, it constituted a perfect sphere that stretched a few hundred feet into the ground beneath us. The conditions within the anomaly mirrored those of the vacuum of outer space. Water could not penetrate the sphere. It acted almost like a bubble keeping the water from gaining entry. The entire base was set up within the sphere, and we all wore gear as though we were astronauts on the International Space Station. What originally drew us to the location was sound vibrations picked up by a passing covert submarine. It detected highly unusual readings that left many unsure what could have caused the noise. Fearing some unknown weapon, action was quickly taken to determine the source of the mystery. After days of no progress, a breakthrough was realized when someone compared the sound to a recent satellite audio recording taken from a close flyby of the planet Jupiter. The sound coming from beneath the ocean was unmistakable. It was the sound of Jupiter's big red dot. From within the base, the sound is ever present as it vibrates up from beneath us. The vibrations very clearly originate from the core of the anomaly and move outward in all directions. Our goal was to send Lucy and Victor down to the core to determine the source of the noise and provide both audio and video recording of what they saw and heard. Their path down had already been pre-drilled by a machine operated robotically by the first expedition. They would both be supplied with appropriate oxygen and life support like that of an EVA on a NASA mission. They would be bound to their respective stations by a thick cord that could be used to retrieve them in the event of an emergency. During their expedition, I would be monitoring sound from the anomaly as well as sound readings coming directly from the planet of Jupiter, provided by an orbiting satellite. These sounds were out of sync as the sound coming from the anomaly was received immediately whereas the readings from Jupiter came significantly later due to the time it took for the signal to travel to Earth. I would still take the time to ensure that the later sounds arriving from Jupiter synchronized with the sounds recorded earlier from the anomaly. Lucy and Victor both prepared themselves in their own stations and emerged simultaneously. They were each equipped with a head-mounted camera and microphone. Their live feeds were sent to all of the stations within the anomaly as well as to our forward base floating above on the surface. They would proceed down to the center of the anomaly and take appropriate readings before returning. They slowly descended into the tunnel below, gliding through the zero gravity with ease. It would take them roughly five minutes to reach the center, at which point they would begin data collection. I began to notice as they grew closer that the sounds produced by the anomaly began to grow slightly. I was unable to determine if the increase was real or imagined. I could not shake the feeling of impending dread as I saw them approach the center and slow themselves to begin their investigation. Watching the video feed, it seemed as though their flashlights were swallowed entirely by a void at the center of the anomaly. They took out their instruments and took the appropriate readings. 
The first three minutes passed without incident. Suddenly, without warning, something emerged from the void and streaked across the video feed. We immediately lost communication with them. The cords connecting them to their stations pulled taut and dug into the ground around the tunnel through which they had entered. Power to the station was lost, and we moved to emergency power. A light brighter than anything I had ever seen shot up from the tunnel and ejected beyond the top of the anomaly into the blackness of the ocean. I averted my gaze and then heard a crackle from my radio as the power suddenly returned. Lucy and Victor both communicated that they were all right, but could not remember what had happened after we had lost contact with them. Command instantly ordered them to return to their stations for debriefing, and they returned to the surface. When they came back up through the tunnel, I noticed that their cords had snapped and that they were no longer connected to their suits. Both Victor and Lucy returned to their stations and I listened anxiously to their debrief. They shed little light on what had occurred and it seemed as though they knew less about the event than I did. Their responses were melancholy and I was impressed by how much resolve they were able to show despite what they had gone through. After ending their debriefs, they visited Cassandra and life support to undergo sanitation to remove any dangerous bacteria they may have been exposed to. It was, at this moment, roughly a half hour later, that I received the sound data from Jupiter that occurred at the moment of the event. The sound of the storm had not changed, but it was accompanied by a new sound that caused my skin to turn pale. Amongst the churning clouds of Jupiter, I heard the electronic signals that had been attached to Lucy and Victor's spacesuits. It seemed impossible as I had seen them emerge from the tunnel myself. It was not possible that their signals could be coming from a near Jupiter orbit. As I checked and rechecked the signal, I overheard Cassandra over the radio. She said that she would need to complete a psychiatric evaluation on me as soon as possible to ensure the event had not impacted me in any major way. I thought this odd and then realized that her tone had changed from her usual chipper demeanor to one of bland melancholy. I did not respond to her message, but instead saw something moving outside. I witnessed Lucy and Victor throwing a large bag into the tunnel that led to the center of the anomaly. As it fell, they moved and turned towards me and began to approach. I've lost communication with our forward operating base, and I've locked the front door of my station. It's been three hours since they first ventured out, and a steady stream of Lucy's and Victor's have emerged from the tunnel. There are well over 50 of them now. They're standing outside and waiting. They know I can't stay here forever. <laughs>